Hi, everyone. Welcome to Ubico's Fireside Chat. I'm Ronnie Manning, the CMO at Ubico and today's moderator. For more than a decade, Ubico has helped millions of people and thousands of businesses stop phishing and put an end to account takeovers. And we believe that it's our social responsibility to put our products in the hands of those people that need them the most. October is Cybersecurity Awareness Month, which is dedicated to educating individuals, especially those most at risk, on how to protect themselves online. It is timely for us to highlight our commitment to protecting at-risk individuals, including those fighting for freedom of speech and human rights, which is why we're honored to have these three incredible journalists and activists on our panel for our fireside chat today. After the chat, we will also be highlighting more details on our expanded Secure It Forward program for at-risk individuals. Today, we will be speaking with Arzu Gebula, a journalist focusing on human rights and press freedom in Azerbaijan, Melanio Escobar, the founder of Reyes Ayuda and also a journalist, and Harlow Holmes, the CISO and Director of Digital Security for Freedom of the Press Foundation. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining today. Uh, and, and now I'd like to uh, begin. So for in introductions, Arzu, I'll give you the floor to uh, share more about your experience and the type of stories that, that, you're, that you're working on. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, well, as you briefly introduced me, I am a journalist. I am originally from Azerbaijan, uh, but based in Turkey. Uh, from where I continue covering Azerbaijan, but also um, the region at large. So the Southern Caucasus, Armenia, Georgia, and also Turkey. Um, my main focus is rather <laughs> expansive. Uh, I write on many issues, of course, uh, but in the last couple of years, I've really been focusing on information controls in Azerbaijan, um, the type of authoritarian technology that is being used to target civil society, um, the state of surveillance. And because of that work and because of my interest um, in that direction specifically, um, in 2019, I launched a project called Azerbaijan Internet Watch um, that does basically uh, documentation and monitoring of the state of information controls in the country. And uh, this month, actually, um, together with a Brussels-based organization called International Partnership for Human Rights, we launched a new report on internet shutdowns in Azerbaijan that the country experienced last year during the war with Armenia. And it's a report that doesn't just look at um, internet shutdowns, but we also look into the extent of surveillance kind of uh, going back um, in the timeline and um, looking at what has happened in the country, the type of technology that's been purchased and um, the type of crackdown that is being used online um, against civil society activists. And also looking at the legal framework that exists in the country, sort of, you know, trying to understand how is it that the government so easily can spy or survey or use all of this kind of technology. Um, and yeah, I mean, that's that's been predominantly my focus. And once again, thank you for having me. Thank you. And thank you for, for sharing. Uh, Melania, love to... Uh, hear about the important work that uh, you're doing with Ray Sayuda and also um, you know, as a journalist. Thank you, Ronnie. Thank you, Yubico, and everyone here for having me. Um, I'm Melanio Escobar. I'm a Venezuelan journalist now based in Miami. I'm the founder of Red Sayuda, which is an NGO that works in human rights, digital rights, and free speech all across Latin America. Obviously, all the team is based in Venezuela, but we try to engage with most of organizations around Latin America to try to figure out what is happening with authoritarian governments and surveillance and attacks against civil society. Regarding to that, we just published our latest report on digital rights and the government harassment against free speech and journalists online. And also we have this new scope of work about physical attacks. So our latest report is called Confined Voices, but it has the 1.0 version and the 2.0 version. The 1.0 is regarding to physical attacks against journalists and free media. The one that is called 2.0 is regarding to online attacks. So that's what 
uh, we are working on right now, and that's what I do and what I am. Great. Thank you. Uh, Harlow, uh, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Uh, love to hear about um, you know, what you're doing at Freedom of the Press. Sure. Um, Freedom of the Press Foundation is a nonprofit organization based out of the United States uh, where we support journalists um, from a purely technological and advocacy sense um, that are working in the public interest. And so we have three, I guess, major pillars. One is our um, you know, technology wing where our engineering team uh, works on a variety of projects, including our biggest one, which is called Secure Drop, which is a whistleblowing platform that from a technological perspective can connect members of the public at large to journalists at large newsrooms across the entire planet with um, you know, like documents that they can share anonymously before investigative teams go to publish. Um, we also do have a, a, a really strong advocacy wing um, that works on a variety of issues, such as ensuring that you know uh, pressure is put on um, newsrooms to make sure that their news sources are secure. So there's a project called Secure the News um, that we had started that uh, you know like actually monitors news websites, public facing websites. Uh, to to see that they're actually providing as much you know encryption to people as their public visits their site um, we also are really proud of our u.s press freedom tracker which is one of the most uh, important i think projects that we've worked on to date uh, that <clears throat> um, is our own little newsroom where we um track down, monitor, and uh, report on uh, incidents across the United States where uh, members of the press have had their right to report trampled on. Um, and use that as an arm to not only like provide a voice to what has actually happened, but to provide a data set that anybody can work with via our API. Um, and my or, uh, part of the organization, which we're very proud of, is you know the digital security training and consulting services that we do. We work with a number of uh, freelance journalists, journal, um, consult with large media organizations on how they can implement things such as account security, such as combating online harassment, et cetera. And uh, we also work very, very closely with documentary filmmakers. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you for, for all the work work that you are doing. Um, so let's let's jump in. Uh, you know, we want these to be open questions. We want dialogue between between the panelists today. But uh, for a first question, what are some of the challenges uh, faced by journalists and activists around the world? And uh, let's start this one with our zoo. We lost your sound. Or is it, you, or you may have muted. You're mute. I am muted. Here we go. <laughs> uh, so many challenges. I think what I'm seeing now, and especially I'd say in the last two to three years, um, is an increasing amount of digital attacks uh, that journalists are facing. And I'm here talking about you know account compromise. I'm talking about phishing attacks. But I'm also referring to DDoS attacks. And in the context of, you know, Azerbaijani media, because uh, many of the independent opposition websites are actually blocked in the country, you know, facing a DDoS attack uh, at a website that is sort of providing up to date news about what's happening in the country is a really challenging um, setback for the journalists who are managing this platform or who are working for these news organizations and that's precisely because when something like this happens you know instead of focusing on delivering news on reporting the news and preparing the news for the journal public they are then kind of faced with this emergency situation when they have to fix the website or they have to find a um, support mechanism to make sure that you know the website continues streaming or you know the the news keep coming um, on, on their platforms. And it is becoming uh, almost, it has become so common to deal with this. Like, you know, if, if a couple of years ago, you know, we would have these um, reports from journalists uh, telling us that, oh, you know, I've been, um, uh, I've received an email that looks like phishing. Can you please help? Like, I don't know what's happening or my device has been infected or there's, um, um, you know, hacking of my, my social media accounts. Now it's almost become a norm. And that is to say like, you know, the challenge itself is almost like part of 
the daily uh, reporting experience is like every day you kind of have to prepare yourself that something may happen to your account or something may happen to your website. Um, so in addition to, you know, the general environment of, of crackdown on independent media, you also have this additional layer of digital crackdown. And it really makes it hard for journalists to kind of stay focused on the work that they're supposed to be doing, what they want to do, and try to balance too, too many things. Um, and then also, I think in terms of the social media platforms and how they're using the social media platforms to share the work that they're doing. Because once again, referring to the case of Azerbaijan, because the websites are blocked, the social media platforms are sort of this uh, almost in a way main medium from where they um, not only share their news, but they also uh, reach out to their audience asking for stories, asking their audience to submit stories and comment and, and whatnot. And when you know these social media accounts get hacked or they get compromised and the media platforms lose their content, they lose their followers, it sets them back uh, as if you know they have to start from scratch and this whole um, environment really creates a, um, it's, it's, it's beyond challenge. It's, it's almost like, you know, you have to adjust all the time 24 seven and find a way to keep going and yet making sure that you're protecting yourself, you're protecting your sources and, and whatnot. Would anyone else like to add? Yeah, of course. I mean, listen to our show, you can see the similitudes between Azerbaijan, Turkey, or whatever, to the Venezuelan government. Or, or, I mean, even so, other governments that are authoritarian in the region, in Latin America region, it seems like they gather together in the injustice hall and shares like knowledge and how to harass journalists and free media because they all do the same. The other thing that journalists are struggling now, it's the economic model of free media. They are not, uh, they are not funded by people buying subscriptions or people buying the magazines or people buying, I don't know, the newspaper. Right now, the only economic model that is still alive is donors. And the authoritarian governments are blocking the ways to this free media to get access to grants or money to continue doing their work. So it's not only like facing all these threats online, it's also facing threats in the legal system of their own countries. So you get everything mixed up and there's no time to think about security or two-factor authentication for my accounts. It's all, right now, journalists are in a phase that they only have to put down the fire when it happens. Yeah. They don't take prevention that seriously. So that I think that sense of um, being always under a threat, online, legal, or physical threat, doesn't allow journalists to think about being secure all the time. So that's why people like Arsu or Harlow or myself are working constantly trying to teach them how to focus on the security first and then whatever it comes next yeah yeah so let, let me let me bridge that kind of to to the next question so you know i'll uh propose this to harlow but what are some of the steps that that based on everything that we just discussed you know what are some of the steps um that you can take to keep yourself safe as a as a journalist yeah I know that's a very broad question it is, it is. And actually, I'd love to um, pick up where Melanio um, uh, left us, which has to do with, uh, you know, uh, putting out fires. And so in our consultations, uh, we love working with smaller organizations. And thankfully, we do have like the bandwidth to do so um, in order to put in certain preventative measures before like uh, things get to the point where fires need to be put out. So um, as the adage goes, you know, like a, an ounce of Prevention is worth more than a pound of cure, um, and that is where we talk to um, you know either site administrators or people who just work in you know at in editorial um, who can be security champions, as we like to say, um, about you know how to apply certain measures um, not only to you know your infrastructure so your public can continue to visit, but also to um, you know the uh, newsroom uh, personnel that you have either on staff 
or what you should, you know, just let freelancers that you work with know about, you know, um, credential security, uh, two-factor authentication, what to expect in terms of retaliation as far as those accounts are concerned as you, you know, before you publish. Yeah. Thank you. So what, what, one that was kind of mentioned before was there's the, um, and Melania specifically, the, the, the digital security, but then there's also the physical security. Do you want to kind of elaborate more about those threats that we're, that we're seeing as well? Yeah, of course. In our latest report in Redis Ayuda, we documented more than 200 attacks against journalists only in 2020 in Venezuela, physical attacks. That includes yeah. um, assassination, incarceration, legal, legal procedures against them, um uh as see uh equipment ceases as um cease equipment ceases. that's something that really bothers you uh, worries you uh, because that's where everything is on when a journalist gets her his phone taken off when he gets her his laptop taken off that's where everything goes to hell because there is where all the information lies, the sources, the people that fund the media or fund the journalists to conduct the story, all the information that can get him in really trouble and other people trouble is what worry us the most. And that's why we try to focus on getting them the right tools to protect everything that he's carrying on. I'm lucky enough to have two phones. So I get one phone that doesn't have anything when I have to cover up demonstration. If I get arrested and my phone is taking, there's nothing there besides the right now communication that I have with someone in the office. But that's not the case for many journalists. Like I said before, the economic model is really hard and they, they, they don't have all the resources that they should have to conduct their work safely. That's why we try to teach them how to back up, how to hide information, how to have better uh, behavior using um, message apps like WhatsApp or Signal or Telegram or whatever he used. Mm -hmm. And that's why we teach them how to use two-factor authentication because not every government is the same and not all the threats are the same. Maybe in Venezuela, you can get detained and you get your phone taken and maybe they can force you using violence to give up the password or open everything, but that's not the same case in, I don't know, um, Mexico, or maybe, yes, maybe Mexico is another best example, but maybe in another country it's not the same. So that's why you have to protect everything so the police or people in power that want to get to your information cannot have it. Yeah, makes sense. Arzu, um, Harlow, any thoughts? I mean, there is really not much I can add to what Melania said because you know the 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 physical. In, in fact, I feel like we've made a transition from being worried about physical security to now being worried about digital security because, in some countries and in some contexts where. Um, you know, we have friends and colleagues operating uh, where we know that, you know, going out on a street is probably going to get you detained or, um, you know, thrown into jail. Like you kind of try to do the work remotely. Um, and you do realize, obviously, the potential of the physical threat if you go. And so, you know, now everyone is more concerned about, you know, how do I make sure that even when I'm re reporting remotely, that, you know, I don't get compromised, that I I am able to protect my IP, that the government cannot track me or cannot track me the people on the ground. Um, but having said that, once again, I think you know, it all comes together. It's part of the package, you know, being able to protect yourself physically and being able to protect yourself digitally, it needs to be hand in hand. It needs to go hand in hand. And um, I think especially with the Pegasus uh, revelations right now, even though we know how, um, we were seeing how, you know, on the on the on the digital level, how this was dangerous. It still puts so many people on those devices into danger because, you know, these are your contacts, these are your sources, these are your family members, these are your friends who are being targeted. So, um, 
you know, you asked me what were the challenges and I feel like, you know, the challenges isn't just about the safety of ourselves as professional journalists, but also the challenge of our jobs today is making sure that everyone is protected and safe, at least the people within our immediate circle, uh, whether we're talking about colleagues or, or, or friends or family. Um, yeah, it's, it's, um, it's an incredible transition to me when I when I look at what we talked about a couple of years ago when we would talk about safety of journalists and to what we're talking about today when we talk about the same issues. And besides, Arsu, it's it's one of the things that we have learned over the time is that the chain is as strong as the weakest link. So it's not only teaching the journalists how to be safe. It's not only giving him the tools to be safe online or safe on the streets. It's also trying to make him understand that he has to make everyone around him aware of the threats because one of the things that we saw often, we see often, is that maybe the executive director of the NGO knows how to be secure and knows everything, but the accounting guy doesn't know mm -hmm. anything about to be secure because he thinks he's not under threat because I'm only running numbers, I'm only taking the money and making the payments, I'm not the principal figure inside the NGO, I'm not the journalist or whatever, but when you are going to get attacked, most likely they're going to use anyone that doesn't have the security measures as you as you have. So most likely you, ne you need to be <laughs> surrounded by people that it needs to be aware of the threats and make the necessary changes on their behaviors to be everyone safe. So it's, it's like a constant uh, concern for us as trainers and people that accompany um, journalists that trying to teach them that be aware of that. Mm -hmm. I would love to hear um, uh, any of the tips that you have uh, regarding how to like, you know, kind of push um, people into higher awareness of their security when they are working in those like, you know, like more like auxiliary um, functions, um, you know, around a newsroom or around a project. So for instance, um, one thing that I actually hear from filmmakers um, is that, you know, after they go through a digital security consultation, uh, they will, you know, like do everything that they need to do in order to make sure that they're keeping that project safe. And, you know, they've gotten to a point where they have what, uh, they call it an industry like a sizzle reel, um, which is pretty much, you know, like the pretty cool highlights uh, accompanied with a description yeah. about what this particular documentary is about. Mm -hmm. And then as they shop that to funders in order to like find, you know, people who will actually put their um, a film in theaters and support them on their, you know, various like film circuits or whatever uh, during the festival season, um, those people actually tend to fall down in security. And so now you have a film that might actually touch on a subject that is incredibly controversial, that has a lot of footage within it that is going to be, you know, like pretty like, you know, uh, bait, let's say, um, for retaliation. Um, and yet you have to then, after taking so much care of that film, you have to deliver it under um, unsafe methods in order to get funding. So this is actually a really interesting conundrum that we work with um, that I would love to be able to solve. Um, so far, we have been, um, you know, reaching out not only to, you know, the uh, the filmmakers and journalists themselves, but looking forward um, to how the newsrooms, how the funders, how like the infrastructure of any particular medium can support all of the work that we had been doing. And so, as Arzu says, that like, you know, the um, our focuses have shifted over the past couple of years as trainers. This is actually the tension that I see and the evolution of, you know, like digital security training going forward. Okay. Apologies for the noise, by the way. No, no it's problem. okay. Yeah, it, it's interesting what you said, Alani. It's, 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 it's that every employee, every user, every part of an organization becomes a target. It, yeah, a everyone becomes a target and you have to get them be aware of that. That's that's the thing. They need to know how how difficult it's going to be for the attacker to get the information they want if everyone tries to maintain at least the minimum layer of security between the organization and everyone working together. That's the thing you need to, to teach them. But at the same time, it's very difficult for a journalist struggling with multi-platform 
like uh, broadcasting news because in most of the countries where we see this kind of attacks and harassment, free media doesn't have like a conventional space to broadcast their news. Most likely they're using Twitter, they're using Telegram, channels on Telegram, they're using, I don't know, WhatsApp, and they're using Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, whatever, at the same time, because they have to reach the mere amount of uh, audience in between all these platforms because they don't have a TV channel, or they don't have a newspaper. So at the, it's, it's like this constant struggle between being secure all the time mm -hmm. and being able to post the news instantly you know that's that's the challenge that that i see right now trying to teach them to be secure but at the same time being able to share all their news or the investigations or whatever they are reporting on like right now mm -hmm. uh, but it's there it's really difficult that that's why i think that creating new ways to uh, secure our accounts more easily is the right path for this challenge to be solved. That's why I use my Ubico that just plug it into your phone and you're in. You know, that's the thing because at the beginning it was a really bit hard because you needed like a USB to plug the Ubico and it was, it was a, a, a little bit harder. But right now when you can tap your phone or plug it, Right now, it's it's easier for journalists. Great. Let's go ahead. And if and if I if I may add, I mean, there are a couple of things um, from 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 sort of like observing what's happening in in our community. Um, you know, your concern when you are trying to make sure that your digital safety, your awareness of your digital presence and digital hygiene is top notch, you know, it has to be shared by everyone you're working with, right? Mm -hmm. um, just like Melania was saying, you know, if the accountant it doesn't share the same concern with you, the chances of you know you getting hacked through that accountant on whatnot are pretty pretty high. Mm -hmm. And you know, we've seen how in some of the cases where, for instance, account compromise have taken place especially on social media platforms, it has happened through the old email that belonged to a staff member that probably not even, uh, no longer is part of the team. Yeah. Uh, and that also kind of creates this constant um, attention that you have to dedicate to making sure that, you know, it's not just the concern that's shared, it's not just the, the awareness that is being shared, but also how often you apply this digital hygiene to everything that you're doing, including, you know, going through your, your staff um, emails and accounts and whatnot. I think there's also um, this, I don't, I, I don't know if I should be calling it a trend, but um, the, the understanding of how you how much attention you should be giving to your safety online um, increases when something happens when something bad happens you know all of a sudden you know everyone gets really concerned oh you know shoot yeah. I got hacked like yeah what am I gonna do um, and I also saw that um, during the once the Pegasus uh, revelations came through like a lot of the journalists or people who were um, on the list or whose whose names appeared on the list they were like suddenly um, concerned about their digital hygiene uh, which is also really interesting you know the way the human mind works it's like until it happens to you you don't really pay attention to it but only once it kind of hits you you realize the the extent of of the damage and and how you need to then um, come up with solutions, which may be uh, a little too late because you haven't taken enough measures ahead of time. Um, and then there's one other thing I wanted to, to note on that. Um, and it's about sort of um, applying the, 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 way, the way we approach digital security or digital safety um, it the the application of it i think is is it needs to be open to change um just yeah. like uh, as 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 harlow was also saying about, about documentary filmmakers i feel and i see that um for instance with donor communities you know before you know they would only speak to you over email and that email correspondence has to be like you know a certain way now you know everyone is aware of the circumstances on the ground and the environment and atmosphere so they would talk to you via signal and they wouldn't ask for like the uh, sort of the official 
correspondence that that used to be. Um, so I think that is changing, and I think it's really good that it's changing. But I think we need to keep uh, working on. Um, being aware of the fact that just communicating over signal obviously is not going to be enough. Uh, you know, the, the the extent of flexibility when it comes to digital safety uh, needs to sort of be there the whole time, but also not be too flexible so that not to create any gaps. It may sound a little confusing what I'm trying to say, but you know, in my head it makes a lot of sense when when I try to when I try to yeah. explain it. It makes total sense. I mean, one of the things that I tell donors and NGOs that works in Venezuela specifically is that maybe what works for one doesn't work for you. Mm -hmm. And you, you need to understand when a donor or a source uh, tells you that he needs to speak with you through signal, but you never use a signal, never. And someone in power is tracking your traffic online and sees that every time that you speak with someone, you do it through WhatsApp. And suddenly you're speaking on signal. They cannot know what you're speaking about, but they can know that you're speaking with someone that is sensitive. Mm -hmm. So maybe recommending to someone that you now you have to communicate with this person only through signal could put him more risk or maybe uh, turn on some alarms in the people that is tracking that keep talking through WhatsApp. You know, you have to be flexible. You have to understand the context, what the user uses, and try to figure out a way to do it safer. But you cannot force anyone to follow any security method that you think is going to work without understanding who he is and what he does. Thank you, and thank you for elaborating more uh, on the question. So, uh, Harlow, um, Yubico, ourselves, we've been we've been working with Freedom of the Press for quite some time, um, and and providing uh, you know two factor authentication, security keys, UP keys. I, I just wanted to ask you know your perspective. How has that um, you know how has that helped with your digital training efforts? Um, you know the value that you see there. Absolutely. Um, so uh, it's evolved over like the, the years that we've been partnering with with Ubico. Um, but uh, the first thing is that uh, you can give someone something in their hands that works like entirely out of the box. Um, it does exactly what it needs to do. And also um, you can uh, it's designed in a way that, you know, there's no like complexity to how you can like describe it to somebody and they see immediate results and that that tends to um uh, that tends to make people more enthusiastic and confident that they can like use it after their training going forward so that's like the the key takeaway there um uh, also, like over the years, you know, uh, accommodating different types of ways people use their phone, as Melania was describing, like if I want to go with NFC, boom, I tap it. If I want to go with USB-C or, you know, like a um, lightning or, or whatever, uh, it's always up to you. And uh, that also gives people like a lot of confidence that they can just, you know, like handle it on, on their own and have like as you know, research has shown the most secure method of second factor on any account via these like really really simple mechanisms. Um, also, I really really think that uh, while um, you know like hardware based is definitely the best way to go, um, where you can you know like. Um, or where like a, a service does not accommodate that and you just have to factor authentication via, you know, the software token, meaning those like rotating codes or whatever for two factor um, one time um, OTP, uh, then uh, still being able to like tie that into the physical object via the authenticator app um, that adds like a little bit more security as far as like protecting, you know, your secrets uh, when, uh, you know, the device isn't in use is actually pretty cool. And um, it like it, from like a pedagogical perspective, because I fundamentally do think, um, despite all of like the technical stuff that that I do with our team, I do think of myself as an educator first, and um, I think you know like uh, the class of dis uh, of objects designed by Ubico actually like draw a cohesive thread throughout the security story. So that's it. Great, thank you. 
So you all uh, mentioned earlier uh, that you're working on individual projects, kind of in the introductions, um, and and we these are these are on internet freedoms, on free speech, on digital security training, um, and for for those listening, there will be links to these uh, coming later, and also in the in the follow up email. But um, is there anything else uh, right before we close uh, that anyone would like to add uh, based on the projects you're working on? Um, to kind of uh, t uh, take us, take us, take us home, I guess. Yeah, Ronnie, I, I will take the chance only to say that one of the things that warriors uh, worry us the most uh, was that we found an increase of three hundred percent between twenty nineteen and twenty twenty <laughs> regarding that's the fire alarm. It always uh, lights up. Well, it, it's accurate. I think. Yeah. Well, anyway, I'm gonna mute. End of this later. Oh, poor, poor you. Um, it's not. I'll uh, talk about a couple of. Oh. Harlo, we can't hear you. There we go. Okay, sorry, sorry for the technical difficulties. Um, I'll talk about some of the really excellent um, projects that my colleagues have been uh, working on at Freedom of the Press Foundation. Um, we obviously always have our U.S. Press Freedom Tracker, so that's at pressfreedomtracker.us, um, where you can get the tally of. Um, uh, incidents similar to uh, physical and digital, um, similar to what we've been discussing today. Uh, that team does such amazing work. Um, in my team, my uh, colleague uh, Martin Shelton has uh, created a entire curriculum for journalism schools uh, for you know like people who want to incorporate digital security fundamentals into their uh, J school curricula. So uh, please, uh, there will be a newsletter. I think that's just recently launching so um, you can definitely sign up for that if you or um, perf you know if you're in the uh, the educational space and want to incorporate that into your lesson plan and we also um, have completed with field of vision um, and spearheaded by my colleague Olivia Martin uh, a really awesome uh, compendium for filmmakers uh, and we are going to be holding security clinics des uh, specially designed and catering to uh, documentary filmmakers sometime uh, in October cybersecurity awareness month great Thank you. I, I'm gonna try to finish my idea before the fire alarm starts again. Uh, sorry for that. <laughs> <laughs> the reality of yes, working, I, working from odd places. And afterwards, I'm gonna mute my mic, and that's it. Okay. Well, one of the things that got our attention about our latest report is that between 2019 and 2020, damn, uh, the increase of online attacks increased 300 percent. You know what? You can read the report. We'll, Thank you for having we'll me. We'll provide the link to the report. Thank you. <laughs> uh, oh man, um, I and I really have not much to add other than um, you know, as we're Internet Watch, uh, from based on the work that I've done up until now, um, you know, it, there certainly an increase in the number of cases that we're seeing in terms of. Um, uh, online attacks, uh, not so much DDoS anymore, but more really trolling. Uh, this has been really interesting to monitor. And in fact, I think, um, especially after The Guardian uh, released investigations into how Facebook was kind of ignoring all these fake accounts that were trolling in so many different countries, um, the civil society uh, representatives, it has really kind of come to the attention in Azerbaijan. And every time there is a very sort of popular uh, and critical of the government story, especially on Facebook, uh, which was just recently, like last week I reported on a story uh, and I scrolled down and it's just a fake um, account registered as a page on Facebook and, you know, 
trolling and trolling. It's like 500, 600, 700 comments. Um, so we, we're definitely seeing these kind of trends. There are trends in in, in um, hacking, uh, especially of the social media accounts. But you know, the website is there. Um, everything that we do is on the website. So yeah, feel free to to go and check it out. And um, yeah, thank you once again for for giving the space. Thank you, thank you, and and. Even even with the fire alarm, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm afraid to unmute the mic. Most likely, no. it's gonna sound again. But no. anyway, you can check out the Redis Ayuda Latest Report on our website. Thank you, Yubiko, for having me. Thank, thank you, Arson Harlow. It's great to be here with you guys. It's been a while. Yeah. Yeah. It's been a while. We, we really appreciate the time. This is very very insightful. Great information shared. Um, and before uh, we sign off, I did just want to. Um, let uh, folks know that we've expanded our Yubico for free speech program. It's now called Secure It Forward uh, at Yubico. And, and this program is now open for additional nonprofits and organizations that we're going to support. Uh, so whether you're an organization or nonprofit that's focused on uh, protecting human rights and freedom of the speech or even upholding election uh, integrity and also diversity in tech, uh, we at Yubico are passionate about ensuring that security isn't an obstacle standing in the way of all of the important work that you are doing. Um, so here's some of the contact information. Um, but if you're an organization, as, as mentioned before, working in free speech, human rights, election security, furthering diversity in tech, and would like to leverage the YubiKey for your team or for individuals that you work with across uh, your organizations, then please get in touch with us through our Secure It Forward uh, program. Uh, furthermore, if you are a journalist and in need of a, a YubiKey, you can uh, reach out to any of the organizations uh, here today, or you can get in touch with us directly. Uh, to request a unit, and that is yubico.com slash press. Uh, and lastly, uh, you know, again, just wanted to say thank you um, to those who are watching uh, and to our panelists. Uh, we hope that there were some really useful uh, takeaway stories, uh, guidance, uh, and it was really uh, an honor for me to, to facilitate a space where our panelists can share these stories uh, with you. So please do look for a follow-up email uh, that's going to be containing details from this chat and, and further information. And thank you all again. Have a great day.